From KQED Public Radio in San Francisco, I'm Michael Krasny. Good morning and welcome to the second hour of this morning's forum. Richard Rorty is a famed philosopher, a social critic, a public intellectual, and a Stanford professor of comparative literature. He is quite likely the most quoted living American philosopher. Famed literary canonical high priest Harold Bloom described him as, quote, the most interesting philosopher in the world today. He's the author of Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature, Consequences of Pragmatism, Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity, Achieving Our Country, Leftist Thought in 20th Century America, three volumes of philosophical papers, and Philosophy and Social Hope. Recently, Stanford University Press published a volume of interviews with Professor Rorty, edited by Eduardo Mendieta, entitled Take Care of Freedom and the Truth Will Take Care of Itself. Richard Rorty joins us for this morning's Second Hour Forum, and delighted to have you here. Welcome. Morning. Where did where'd you come by this title? <laughs> um, or, or your editor came by this title? Yeah. It's a slogan I'd been repeating in various books and articles. The idea is that if you have what Habermas calls ideal communication conditions, that is, if you have a free press, free judiciary, independent universities, that kind of thing, you'll automatically get beliefs that are justified to the widest possible audience, and that's the best you can do in the way of searching for truth. Searching for truth, even though objective truth may not be accessible. Well, I'm not fond of the notion of objective truth. That suggests that truth is correspondence to reality. And ever since James and Dewey, uh, pragmatists like me have been saying, we can't make sense out of the notion of a sentence corresponding to the way things are. The only notion in the area we can make sense of is some assertions being better justified than other assertions. Thus pragmatism. Yeah. And you mentioned Dewey and James, certainly the fathers of that uh, indigenous American philosophy. It's got kind of a bad rap through the recent years, though. I mean, especially during the Nixon administration, wouldn't you say? No, I think that was the result of a confusion between pragmatism in the everyday political sense in which it means doing whatever works regardless of the moral issues and philosophical pragmatism, which is something most people don't have any particular interest in, and a theory about the nature of truth and knowledge. You've been called a neo-pragmatist. Is that apt? Not particularly. Um, There are some differences between the philosophers nowadays who call themselves pragmatists, Davidson, Putnam, me, Habermas, and James and Dewey, but the differences are sort of technical and... Basically, we're in the same line of business as James and Dewey were. Some, I think, I think your editor defined it as uh, Hegel without the split between nature and spirit. Yeah, that's that would do. Hegel was the main inspiration for Dewey. Dewey tried to synthesize Hegel and Darwin by getting rid of the idealism in Hegel and keeping the historicism, keeping the idea that philosophy wasn't. The philosopher wasn't a spectator of time and eternity. He was simply somebody trying to hold his or her time and thought. But you have had a you have a well earned reputation as uh, bringing a kind of new direction of philosophy and maybe even leading what some see as a kind of uh, assault, undermining, a debunking of a lot of traditional academic philosophy. Is that fair? Yeah, it's fair. I'm dubious about a lot of what goes on in philosophy departments these days. Uh, I think it's. I think many of my colleagues are still working on problems that made sense in the 17th and 18th centuries. Problems produced by the clash between the religious tradition and the rise of modern science. But I think these problems are now obsolete, have no interest to people in general, and sort of preserved in amber in philosophy departments, generating a kind of scholastic discussion that is of no general interest. It's hermetic. Yeah, hermetic. And, you know, I'm looking in uh, the introduction of the book, uh, Take Care of Freedom and Truth Will Take Care of Itself, the interviews that you've done over the course of a number of decades. And uh, your editor says, still, Rorty is anti-Platonist, anti-Aristotelian, anti-Thomist, anti-Kantian, anti-Cartesian, anti-Hegelian. I mean, we go on, anti-Marxist, but pro Derridian, uh, pro-Davidsonian, pro-Wittgensteinian, pro-Heideggerian. I mean... It's as if we're trying to kind of cut you into different slices or something along those lines. I wondered if that was comfortable for you. Yeah, it's okay. Philosophy works by 
setting up a thesis and then generating an antithesis, just as Hegel said. I mean, we stay in business by arguing with one another. So to find out what a philosopher believes, you find out who he's against and who he's for. You've uh, been identified as being for, I guess, what could be described as more liberal views or more moderate views. In fact, your own roots go back to your parents were kind of Trotskyites, or they were Trotskyites. They started out as regular party-line communists and then got disillusioned with Stalin and became Trotskyites and then gradually moved further and further toward the right, wound up voting for Nixon in 68. And Sidney Hook was uh, an important player in your family yeah, constellation? Uh, Hook and my father left the party at the same time and had virtually parallel careers from that point on. So when you criticize, for example, as you've done the academic left and you make the difference between the old reformist left and the more cultural or academic left, you're coming at this from maybe a traditionally moderate point of view? Uh, I mean, politically, at least. You've compared, at one point, you compare your politics to Hubert Humphreys. Yeah, I think that... Well, when I was young, people like Humphrey were my heroes. Uh, I remember in the 68 election, all my colleagues in the philosophy department at Princeton were deciding whether or not to vote for Eldridge Cleaver, and I just automatically voted for you, Humphrey, because I I didn't see any need to be more radical than Humphrey was. So uh, in the 60s, I thought that leftism was making itself ridiculous by not sticking to the standard alliance between the intellectuals and the trade unions that had worked during the New Deal and worked for Johnson's Great Society. You also indicted them for a kind of uh, American bashing or a freewheeling American bashing, uh, anti-patriotic kind of bashing, no? Yeah, I wrote a piece called The Unpatriotic Academy saying intellectuals can't possibly have any influence on the politics of a country if they affect to despise their own country, affect to despise the community to which their fellow citizens are loyal, and that the the best strategy for the left would be the ones the labor unions adopted in the 30s to say there's nothing more American than joining a labor union. <laughs> there's nothing more American than taking part in ordinary American party politics rather than trying to overthrow the system. Wouldn't that desire to overthrow the system, though, I mean, just in this historical context, be kind of what you call contingency? It was part. It was transformable, but it was contingency having being contingent on the times, the zeitgeist? It, yeah, uh, I mean... Anything that happens can be thought of as an historical contingency, but some historical contingencies are worse than others. The rise of fascism in Europe was an historical contingency. <laughs> in fact, I, I, I believe that, uh, according to your editor, it's not only contingency that you have become identified with and, and is part of your enduring reputation as a philosopher. It's also irony and solidarity. And when you speak of solidarity, are you talking about that kind of trade unionism solidarity? Yes, I think that's the paradigm of people getting together for a common cause and committing themselves to live as members of a community united by a desire to make the future better than the past. And where does irony fit into this whole picture of pragmatism? Well, that's where philosophy comes in. in the pragmatist said, stop trying to see yourself under the aspect of eternity, to see yourself as God sees you. Stop trying to step outside human history. Just think of yourself as caught within the contingencies of history and try to devote yourself to making the future for the species better than the past has been. Talking with Richard Rorty, and the book has been put out by Stanford University Press of interviews with Richard Rorty edited by Eduardo Mendieta and titled Take Care of Freedom and Truth Will Take Care of Itself. When, when philosophy gets kind of stultifying in the academy, the way you sometimes characterize it, does it really not play the kind of relevant role that, in fact, we used to talk about in the 60s, that is social justice, serving citizens, serving society in general? Most of the time, philosophy is just an academic discipline, Every once in a while, there's somebody uh, who breaks the mold and revitalizes people's imaginations. Um, that's what Kant did, especially in his political writings. John Stuart Mill did it. Nietzsche did it. Heidegger did it, though. Heidegger took people, I think, in the wrong direction. Philosophy is primarily, like literature, a matter of the sudden eruption of a genius who makes, who redescribes 
what's been going on in philosophy, makes philosophy new, revitalizes the discipline. Um, the rest of us, you know, the tens of thousands of philosophy professors just wait for the next genius to come along. Now you're being modest. There are people who put you in that uh, in that lineage. Uh, but there's also the sense of, um, of, of philosophy needing perhaps to serve a more utilitarian purpose, which I get from your writings, or not necessarily... I, I don't think of it that way. I, I think it's... I think philosophy is just a tradition of writing. You, know, you can tell somebody's a philosopher because they've read Plato, they've read Aristotle, they've read Descartes, Locke, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Wittgenstein, stuff like that. It isn't a special thing. It isn't a tool that you can take and apply to this and apply to that. It's just an intellectual tradition. All unmarried men, for the most part, once came up on a program we were doing. Most of the major philosophers. Well, between Socrates, Socrates was married, Aristotle was married, and then none of the canonical figures were married until Hegel. But I don't. Th I doubt that has any great significance. It seems as if you have moved more into narrative and more into literature, though, in terms of your own excavation of thought. Well, I, I think. Moving into narrative is what characterizes so-called continental philosophy as opposed to so-called analytic philosophy. In Britain and America, Australia, English-speaking countries, philosophy conceives itself as a, pro a problem-solving discipline. Uh, in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, the philosophers who are studied most intensively are the philosophers who wrote narratives of the development of Western thought, the development of Western culture, who had suggestions to make about how the future of the West might be different than the Western past. So I think that there's analytic problem-solving, quasi-scientific philosophy on the one hand and narrative philosophy on the other, and I prefer narrative philosophy. You also seem to, speaking about continental versus perhaps what's... Uh characteristic of this hemisphere seemed to locate this whole idea of multiculturalism at one point in one of your interviews as being largely a phenomenon associated with American culture. Elevating it, that is, and adv advocating it. I, I've never been able to make much sense of the notion of multiculturalism. Uh, it's, it's one thing to say that streams of immigration into a country produce a hybridized culture with elements coming from all over the world, which has always been characteristic of the United States. It's another thing to say that we ought to have a lot of cultures existing side by side, and somehow the more cultures, the better. It seems to me the only point of a culture is to get together with other cultures, hybridize, recreate itself, produce a larger, synthetic, richer culture. Solidarity, in other words, again. Well, solidarity between people with different backgrounds, right. different assumptions, different traditions. Which you call pluralism. Uh, okay. You know, I mean, in what you feel really needs to be advocated. Uh, yeah, I'd prefer pluralism as a slogan to multiculturalism. But I think of pluralism as saying, in your private life, in your religious life, in your spiritual life, uh, be free to be as distinctive, as different from everybody else as you want to be. When it comes to public affairs, your culture, your individual ideals of perfection, your religion should be irrelevant. You should think of yourself as simply part of a, demo a community of democratic fellow citizens. I'd ask you maybe to stand back for a moment and tell me um, what provides hope for you, particularly because... Um, at one point, you, you describe metaphysics as a boring subject and say the end of metaphysics is not a matter of despair or nihilism. But uh, this particular book of interviews ends with a good deal of pessimism about nuclear war, about uh, the wage gap or the income gap between undeveloped nations and the developed world. And yet hope seems to be a cornerstone of a lot of your philosophy. So where does hope emerge? I, I wrote some lectures once called Hope in Place of Knowledge, the idea was that to give our lives meaning, 
we don't have to know what we really and truly are or what the universe really and truly is or what God really and truly wants or which God is the true God. We just have to have hope that later stages of our own lives and the lives of future generations will be better than earlier stages or past generations. So I think of James and Dewey as saying, don't think that morality has foundations in knowledge. Uh, don't think that you will know what you truly are. Just try to change yourself and so as to become different from what you were. So I I use hope as a name for what what keeps progress going. I think of progress as not aiming toward a goal that is already out there, but as aiming toward a goal which is constantly being refashioned as human generations change. So change is really hope, or hope and change seem to be... Um, well, ch 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 change in the direction... Progress. Pro yeah. In the last 200 years of the West have been progress in the direction of increasing freedom. We've, you know, we emancipated the slaves, we got universal male suffrage, we got female suffrage, we got the American Civil Rights Movement, we got anti-racist movements, we got, got anti-homophobia movements. It's been 200 years of enormous moral progress. And to ask, you know, what, how do we know it's progress seems to me a dumb question. I mean, if you want philosophy to assume the standpoint of eternity, you step back from the last 200 years of the West and say, by what criterion is it progress? By what standard is it progress? These seem to me completely unanswerable questions. If that wasn't progress, we'll never know what progress is. The question is, can we keep up our hopes for further progress along the same lines? I'm thinking about some of the existential philosophers, though. I mean, when you talk about... Uh the large picture, you know, somebody like Camus saying uh, eternal nothingness, what is, uh, what do our actions mean in terms of 5,000 years from now and all of that uh, kind of, it's daunting, of course, in, in the grand scheme of things. But I, I, I think if you forget about eternal nothingness or the quest for eternal being and just forget about eternity, you can say, look, I'll tell you what life might be like 5,000 years from now. Here's a science fiction book which gives a utopia, a utopian galactic civilization built on the foundations of the West from the French Revolution onward. <laughs> you know, that it might happen. It's, it's very unlikely, but it's about as good a source of, you know, moral energy as anything you're going to get. So pragmatism can be built on hope, really, or foundation of hope, That's a, well, utopian hope. Yeah, I think of pragmatism as saying, you know, if hope isn't good enough for you, don't try to stick God or metaphysics or anything in in place of hope. You know, if you haven't got hope for the future, you haven't got anything. And you won't get further hope by learning more about Scripture or the nature of reality. Or by theory. I mean... Or by theories about anything, yeah. In fact, uh, when, when you talk about the, the academic left, uh, the, what you call the cultural left, you say there should be a moratorium on theory. Well, that's just a remark about the contemporary American humanities departments. I mean, the, the English department, the literature departments generally sort of went crazy for this thing called theory in which thousands of Ph.D. theses were written by reading some theorist and then in a stupid formulaic way applying the jargon of that theorist. to Usually a French theorist, text. we should add, <laughs> Uh, we generated theorists of our own. I mean, it's the French reading the French started it, but then America produced its own homegrown theorists. But we just overdid it. I mean, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with theory. It's just that it became a shibboleth in the American Academy, and that's pretty much over. Literary theory is almost dead, and yet it still has its appeal, particularly to many literary critics and and scholars. Um, not necessarily so much, you know, Foucault and Derrida, um, or for that matter, Stephen Greenblatt and the new cultural historians, but uh, just looking at things through maybe a Marxist lens or a psychoanalytic lens or a feminist lens. These are all theoretical lenses. I think that looking at a literary text through a theoretical lens produces very dull criticism. I mean, you know, 
Marx was right about a lot of stuff. Freud was right about a lot of about a lot of stuff. The feminists, God knows, were right about practically everything they said. But just having a new insight of the sort that Marx, Freud, and the feminists had doesn't guarantee that you have anything anything interesting to say about the book you're writing about. So what kind of narrative are you drawn to now? Um, the kinds of stories about the West which say how we got out from under uh, religion, how we secularized culture, and how we might secularize culture further by giving up the hope for metaphysical foundations for knowledge to underpin hope and just live on pure hope. It must uh, be somewhat distressing to you then uh, to think of, well, last hour we were talking about how people view the State of the Union and a couple of callers said they were concerned that there were theocratic signs in this country and you've talked about evangelical Christianity as being a concern, the rise of it. Yeah, I, it's something I simply don't understand. Sociologists tell you that the course of socio-intellectual change in large industrial democracies ought to be pretty much parallel in, the very, in various countries. But there's a, an extraordinary asymmetry between contemporary Europe and contemporary America. There is no religious revival in Europe. I mean, we're the the West, the industrial democracies of the West, are by and large getting steadily less and less religious. Uh, the danger of theocracy is becoming less and less, except in America, and that's a phenomenon of the last thirty years. And I really don't know why our country is so different from the rest of the Western world in this respect. Talking to Richard Rorty again, uh, Stanford has published a book of interviews edited by Eduardo Mandieta. It's called Take Care of Freedom and Truth Will Take Care of Itself, Interviews with Richard Rorty. And this is an opportunity for those of you listening to join us with any questions or comments you may have for uh, our guest, who again, uh, Harold Bloom describes as the most interesting philosopher in the world today. We're talking, of course, about pragmatism, but also about um, so many ideas that are really presented to us in these interviews in this collection that's uh, been published by Stanford Press. If you have a question or a comment, you're welcome to join the program. Our toll-free number is 866-733-6786, and we welcome your calls. Again, lines available and talking philosophy here, talking literature, uh, social criticism, and the like uh, with uh, one of the great public intellectuals. Our toll-free number, 866-733-6786, or you can email us. Our email address is forum at kqed.org, and you're listening to Forum. I'm Michael Krasny. This is Forum. I'm Michael Krasny. We're talking this hour with Richard Rorty, who is Professor of Comparative Literature at Stanford and the author of many books, uh, The Mirror of Nature, Consequences of Pragmatism, Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity, just to name a few. And uh, there's now a book of interviews with Richard Rorty put together by Eduardo Mendieta, and um, we're going to go to your calls. Forthwith, how did you and Mr. Mendieta come together? I can't remember very clearly. I think he wrote me a letter uh, raising questions about something I'd written. We got into correspondence. He came out and interviewed me. And then one thing led to another. Uh, he found a Spanish publisher who was interested in collecting my interviews. So they came out in Spanish. And then he persuaded Stanford to publish them in English as well. It's interesting to read. I mean, some of these interviews are done by uh, foreign nationals and to see where they take you in terms of what their interests are in content. Uh, for example, there's an interview with a Polish uh, philosopher, I guess. Uh, yeah, actually, the, the interviews with foreigners are typically better than the interviews with Americans because European journalists tend to have a, a background in literature and philosophy that a lot of American journalists don't have, and they ask much more probing questions. So when you're interviewed by somebody from Mexico or, or Poland or China, you get a lot of questions that American interviewers don't ask you. Well, we'll, we'll try to probe you some more as this hour uh, progresses. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to be impolite <laughs> no, about American journalism. No, that's all right. Uh, we're going to go to our callers and find out what they want to probe, and uh, we'll go to Todd first. Hi, Todd. 
Uh, hi, I have a quick question for the professor. Surely, go ahead. I um, was wondering if he thinks that it's possible that the, um, the rebound of uh, uh, religious fanaticism in America might be due to the fact that we inherited a lot of uh, Europe's um, religious fanatics about 100 or 200 years ago. And I'll take my question off the air. All right, thank you for the call, Todd. I mean, the religious fanaticism in Europe that played itself out in the wars of religion ended with the Enlightenment and the general agreement that religious tolerance was necessary to keep a modern society going. Europe still has the consensus that religion mustn't be allowed to play too large a part in public affairs. We had such a consensus until quite recently. Somehow in the last few decades, that's come into question. You now have people referring openly to America as a Christian nation. That wouldn't have been easy to do 30 years back, I think. It would have suggested religious intolerance. Now people take the notion that we're a Christian nation as a perfectly acceptable idea. It seems to me an altogether unacceptable idea. Also, maybe anomalous in terms of what you were saying earlier, because if if the movement in the West has been more toward secularization, then this is an anomaly, isn't it? Yeah, that's why I find the rise of evangelical Protestantism so puzzling. Uh, in the 30s, when the nation was in really desperate straits, we didn't have a huge religious revival. We did have people like... Father Coughlin, uh, Father Divine, and so on. But basically what the Americans did was to organize trade unions. <laughs> they suddenly came together in mass associations, which took the place of churches as centers for social action. Nowadays we don't have any trade unions anymore, any that have any political weight, and we have churches with enormous weight. When I was a kid... It seemed clear that the influence of the clergy, Catholic and Protestant alike, was steadily declining. Now it seems to be steadily rising, and I have no idea why that's happening. But I think it's very dangerous. We'll hear from some more of you. And uh, Radu, good morning. Uh, hi, Michael. Hi. Um, I have a same comment on the same lines. Um, the reason why probably the influence of religion has increased in America, I have a couple theories. One could be that there are... Republican Party needed um, something to rally around, and this is known to happen in other countries as well, is to use religion, which is a um, which has a high percentage of success in such a rallying cause nature. The other comment could be about diversity. That's what I was thinking, is that maybe the increase of uh, influence of religion in America is higher due to its diversity itself, is when you have so many other cultures around you, a particular set of people, particularly the ones that are in majority feel even more threatened. Well, I'm struck by what you're saying, on, uh, Ryder, excuse me, but, you know, there's a, there's a greater, conti- uh, it's, it's a political thing, uh, Professor Rorty, in many ways. There's a greater constituency that was out there that needed to be molded, whereas with the trade union movement, for example, it's been diminished through the years, and in part, I suppose, some could argue by a lot of skepticism about corruption and all that sort of thing. Well, The trade unions have never been more corrupt than the corporations, but you don't see the corporate structure under attack. More Uh, money. (laughs) Yeah. Well, there's more money to be made out of it. But I... I, um, Sorry, I've lost the thread here. Well, the the, the caller was... uh, Radu was just raising, I think, the the question about maybe the, the diversity being part of this and the constituency, again, being out there for religion, yeah? Well, consider what happened in the waves of immigration in the early part of the 20th century. America became far, far more diverse than it had ever been before as hordes of Italians, Poles, and so on flooded in. The WASP establishment said, gee, the moral fiber of the country is in danger because of all these foreign elements. Maybe the Catholics will take over and so on. Nothing of the sort happened. The country became more tolerant as it became more diverse. Nowadays, it's becoming less tolerant. I also have to ask the question, though, I mean, as long as we're on this thread of thought, why, for example, a country like India doesn't have the sort of Islamic fanaticism that a country like Pakistan does? I mean, they're right next to each other and uh, the same brand of, of Islam. 
Well, most of the Muslims were expelled from India in the, at the time of partition. That's why we have Pakistan as an independent yeah. state. And the Muslims in India are simply an oppressed minority. When you go for the, from a Hindu section of Delhi to a Muslim section of Delhi, it's like going from the suburbs to the ghettos. So the Muslims just don't have it, much of a chance in India. <laughs> And yet they seem to be much more assimilated or much more, uh, much less militant is, is really the point. Yeah. Well, whenever they try to get militant, they get killed. Uh, Good point, I, yeah. Uh, we've got more of your calls. Julie, hi, you're on the air. Morning. Good morning. I, I realize um, hope comes up a lot as the professor speaks, and I remember one of the questions that you asked was where he draws hope from. But I wasn't sure with the response he gave. I wasn't clear on his answer. So I wanted to ask that again. And then um, the second part of my question is um, if he claims any faith, because I know hope and faith go hand in hand. So, And I'll take my question off the air. All right. Thank you for the call. Hope comes from your faith and pragmatism, I guess we could say. Well, I, I think of hope as coming from utopian dreams. You envisage what your life might become in the future if you got married to a certain person, took up a certain career, and so on. And the hope of that, the hope embodied in that dream gives you the courage or the energy to move onward. And I think it's the same for nations, the same for the human species. We dream dreams, and we're attracted by the prospects opened by our own dreams. Religion and philosophy say that there are sources of hope other than the human imagination. This pragmatist view I'm trying to expound says, no, the imagination is the only source of hope. So where do you see hope in, t in terms of narratives, or utopian narratives particularly, that could be applicable? Well... Marx gave us a story about what the future might be like under communism. He was wrong about what it took to bring utopia into existence, but it was a perfectly good utopia. John Stuart Mill gave us a utopia of a just and open society in which diversity and freedom were maximized. Uh, lots of people have given us stories about the world that we could build if we had the courage and energy to build it. These Project, these dreams weren't, it seems to me, based on anything. They were simple imaginative products. Shelley said that the imagination is the great instrument of the moral good, and Dewey keeps quoting Shelley's remark. I think that if we, did, if we stop trying to look outside of our own dreams, our own imagination, for sources of hope, uh, we'd be better off. I'm also thinking about Shelley saying, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just free association. Let me go to more calls. Brooke from Memphis, morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, I was wondering if you'd speak more about the uh, connection of hope and knowledge. You've, you've been mentioning imagination. Um, I'm not quite sure what the what the content of that would be. Is it is it constituted by knowledge in some way? Is that something that we should be wary of or should address? I think of imagination as just whatever it was that enabled Plato to think up the idea of another world containing the pure ideas of goodness and beauty, whatever it was that enabled Newton to think up his, pic his novel picture of how the universe worked, whatever it was that enabled Wordsworth to write the prelude, whatever it is that enabled something new to come into the world. Uh, imagination isn't a very informative term. It's just a name for the production of novelty by human beings. It's vision, maybe, that you're talking okay, about. Okay, vision. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and a kind of idealism, I think, as well, no? Well, idealism, I think of as the courage to commit yourself to what may be only a dream, only in the sense of never to be realized. Let me thank Brooke for his call and... Go to more of your calls. Michael, joining us from Palo Alto. Good morning. Yeah, I was just reading a, an article in uh, Forward, the uh, the Jewish website, uh, I think it's forward.com, 
and how um, you know they claim they I mean it's a Jewish website so they claim the whole neoconservative movement is pretty much a, a, a Jewish run affair and that he gets back to Leo Strauss and uh, the, the build up of the evangelical movement over the last 30 years um, you know there were architects for this and it comes out of the neoconservative movement because they, they have to build a bigger army and um, onward Christian soldiers and uh, let's all die for Israel so I, you know, I wonder what uh, this chap has any comments about that. I I took some courses with Strauss, and I've never understood Leo Strauss. with Leo Strauss, never understood why he is thought of as the ideologist of the current Republican Party. Bush Bush would have been despised by Strauss. The evangelical Christians would have been despised by Strauss. He had no sympathy either for corporate greed or for religious fanaticism. He believed in rule by philosophers, a somewhat crazy idea, but one that doesn't have anything to do with contemporary American conservatism. I don't see that it's the case that the Jews are dominant in the conservative movement. Uh, there are Jews in there. There's There are people of every description in there. Uh, what the strength of the conservative movement is just that they're, they have corporate money and they have uh, the blind fanaticism of the people who believe that God does not hear the prayers of the Jew, God condemns homosexuality, and so on. Thank the caller. Back to pragmatism for a moment. Listener named Richard says, can you ask Professor Rorty about his thoughts about Charles Pierce's relationship with pragmatism? I think the relation is very slim. Pierce used the word pragmatism. James, uh, in a gesture of sympathy for Pierce, who was having a hard time, adopted pragmatism as the name of his own philosophy and gave Peirce the credit for founding it. Peirce then instantly turned on James and said, no, if you know your philosophy and mine have nothing to do with each other, I wouldn't touch you with a stick. Uh, and Peirce was right. Uh, most of what Peirce said has nothing to do with pragmatism or with anything James was interested in. So I find it simpler to think of James and Dewey and just forget, of, to think about James and Dewey and just forget about Peirce. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Dewey was, well, he was teaching like seven, eight subjects and still putting out a few books every year. I mean, just the, the man's productivity by yeah. today's standards is so extraordinary. I, I don't understand how he did it. You know, there's something like 40 volumes in the collected works. Uh, he wrote not just philosophy books uh, um, as well as carrying a teaching load. He wrote almost weekly articles on political subjects for things like the nation and the new republic. Uh, the only person comparable to him in recent time, the only philosopher comparable to him in recent times is Jürgen Habermas. Habermas's productivity is about as large as Dewey's was. He writes great, huge philosophical treatises, but also he appears in the German newspapers every month or so on the topics of the day. He's called the conscience of modern Germany, just as Dewey was sometimes thought of as the conscience of early 20th century America. And I, I think both descriptions are fair. How about the old description about William James, that uh, he was a psychologist who wrote like a novelist, and his brother was a novelist, Henry James, who wrote like a psychologist? He was only a psychologist for 10 years, and when he finished the principles of psychology, he said, boy, am I glad to see the last of that subject. <laughs> uh I've never been a fan of the principles of psychology. Um, also, I think it's, you know, I, I think Henry James's book shouldn't be described as written like a psychologist. They're much better than that. No psychologist ever wrote that well. I'm with you. <laughs> this, uh, a lot of people are responding to the whole question of American religious theocracy and the like. Uh, Susanna, who's a professor of classics, says Richard Wrighty pointed to the divergence between the U.S. and Europe in terms of movement toward and away from theocracy. I would like to know why he thinks that Canada seems totally immune from any theocratic tendency. Good question. I have no idea. And the, the, the moral consciousness in Canada seems so different from that in the United States. And it just seems 
very difficult to explain why these two countries that share, you know, an economy, a history, share practically everything, uh, are going in such opposite directions. The only explanation I've read that Canada had a recent election, however, you know, and elected conservatives. So yeah, by a (laughs) small theocratic by a small margin, and they weren't very conservative, and they had to talk like liberals in order to get elected. the only explanation for the divergence between the U.S. and Canada that I've read that sounded plausible was that the the Johnson was right when he said this: the civil rights laws will lose the South for the Democratic Party. The Republicans picked up the South, and the sheer resentment of the whites who were no longer permitted to bully the blacks may have expressed itself in evangelical Christianity. Some people have written to this effect, and I don't know whether it's true, but I have no better hypothesis. You know W.J. Cash's book, The Mind of the South, uh, The Psychohistory of the I, South? I read it so long ago I can't remember. It's a little bit tangential to what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And, and here's one theory from Jiri, uh, one of our listeners, who says, perhaps the reason why America is moving toward a theocracy is rooted in our history. After all, we're a nation that welcomed religious extremists outcasts from Europe, a nation with little cultural glue to hold us together, a nation founded by the uneducated and poor of the world. And the vast spaces of America means that many new religions, such as Mormons, could develop. It's true. We've always been very good at developing new religions, but it doesn't answer the question, why not Canada? I mean, practically all that's equally true of Canada. They accepted all kinds of religious fanatics from all over the world just the same way we did. But Harold Bloom wrote a book called The American Religion saying that, you know, if you think of Joseph Smith and the Mormons and Mary Baker Eddy and the Christian scientists and the Seventh-day Adventists, there is something special about the United States. We produce more original, striking religions than any other country in the world. There's your word imagination again. Yeah, right? exactly. Religious imagination. Yeah. How do we compare, though? How does the U.S. compare to Europe, for example, just in general terms, in, term, in conjunction with philosophy? You said before that... The Europeans tend to be much more apprised of philosophy. I think that was at least subtextually what you're saying. Yeah. It's just a difference in educational pattern. If if you're middle class in Europe and you'll spend, a, you'll you'll have to go to philosophy class in your last two years of high school. So you arrive in the university already being familiar with names like Plato and Aristotle and Descartes and Locke and Kant. You at least have a rough idea of who they were, what they stood for, what they were arguing about, and so on. In American high schools. Philosophy classes are, you know, rare as hen's teeth. So you get an American kid entering college. He never heard any of these guys. If he takes a philosophy course, it's by sheer accident because his roommate liked it or something like that. What about the differences as far as professional philosophy, the academic philosophy, as you see it? The, The big difference between the U.S. and Europe is that philosophy became a much more technical, highly professionalized, ingrown, inbred discipline in the U.S. in the course of the last 50 years. used to be, in the first half of the 20th century, that if you studied philosophy, you studied basically the history of philosophy, you you know, step by step from Plato down to nature. Uh, Nowadays, if you study philosophy, you study what's new in the philosophy journals, and you you don't necessarily learn much about the history of philosophy. In continental Europe, you still learn about the history of philosophy. So basically, it's two different disciplines that go under the same name in different countries. And let's bring our next caller on, Michael. Morning. Uh, hello. Hi. Oh, I didn't know I was coming on. Professor Ordi, I'm a, a huge fan of yours, and uh, I, I had heard that the Library of Living Philosophers is coming out with a volume on you, so I was calling in with, uh, with the hope that you're taking good care of yourself so that uh, that, that volume will appear. I do my best. <laughs> is, is, it, uh, is it going to be anytime soon? Maybe two, three years, or more like three or four, I suspect. Where, where'd you discover uh, Richard Rorty's work in college? I just, uh, uh, no, I'm a, be 60 this year, and I was just browsing around in the philosophy section of a bookstore back in Texas and stumbled across him and, and, and uh, found, my, uh, found my philosopher, finally. Well, it's good to know that you're in the Texas bookstores. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a whole different topic. As long as I'm on the line here, uh, I'm, I'm seeing more and more uh, talk about impeaching Bush, and I don't see how that could possibly happen given the constitution of our Congress, but uh, 
uh, Professor Orr, do you see any hope of it wouldn't be – if we impeach Bush, you'd have to take Cheney with him. So I, I just don't see that happening. But Yeah, I think impeachment is completely unrealistic. It would be a waste of effort to start such a thing. Besides, I, I don't think – the only impeachable issue is violation of the 1978 Intelligence Act, and that's too gray an area to – really get up a controversy about. So is, is, where is Monica Lewinsky when we really need her, as some wag might say? <laughs> uh, Michael, thank you for that call. Uh, you're listening to Forum. I'm Michael Krasny. We're talking to Richard Rorty, and let's continue. Thomas from Sonoma, good morning. Yeah, I'm, I'm my, I've thought a lot about this, how did the, the Christian right and, and, and all this uh, come about. And I think a great deal of it has to do with the, the the fact that the, the, a lot of the public has been misled by a culture that of of, of corporate directed consumerism, uh, television uh, information. They get their information from television that that doesn't have enough reality in it. It's not accurate enough. Their views of the world are are completely uh, based in fantasy. Uh, so that when something really you know, cold and hard hits them like uh, September 11th, or uh, even going back farther. You know, the, the 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 hippie revolution in the 60s, stopping the Vietnam War and, and challenging the you know U.S. Uh, military you know right to to conquer other countries. I think that, that these things shake the foundations of of people who are uninformed, and so they turn to religion, just like. If, uh, if you know, in, the, in an old tribal culture, maybe there would be an eclipse, and nobody would know what it was. So they'd have to go sacrifice some virgins, you know, to get the sun to come back out. And I think that, that that's sort of what's going on. Say we're more superstitious in this. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the rise of superstition because people don't understand because they've been misled. Well, I don't know that Americans are more misled than Canadians or Frenchmen. Uh, the the press in Britain is even worse than the press in the United States. Uh, the consumerism is about the same uh, throughout the Western world. I think you have to find something much more specific to America. You can't explain the rise of the religious right by consumerism or the media because these are factors that spread across the whole of the Western world. Is this something that you'd want to undertake as a study? Would this interest you enough as a philosophical question to uh, take on? I don't think it's a philosophical question. It's a question a for... cultural question, then, if you will. You know, it's a question for sociologists and political scientists who are willing to do the nitty-gritty work of interviewing, handing out questionnaires, taking surveys, going through the history of the voting patterns in the South... Uh, sociologists of religion who can tell the difference between the new mega churches and the old evangelical churches. It's a, it's a, there, there are people writing good books about this, but philosophy hasn't anything to do with it. As a philosopher, what do you see as the contribution you've made to philosophy? I know, for example, that uh, Carl Hempel, who is someone whom you admired, who was in fact a mentor of yours, uh, has called you into account and I think even called you a nihilist for that matter, uh, which hurt you and, and wounded you, understandably so, because you're somebody you cared about. So w w what would you say to the detractors or to those people who have come out against you? Hempel believed that the natural sciences were a model for the rest of culture. I think of the arts as a model for the rest of culture. It's It's a... It's a very deep disagreement <laughs> and you know, perhaps unarguable. Uh, as far as my contribution to philosophy goes, I think the only stuff I did that a lot of other people didn't do as well was to bring together some stuff from f recent French and German thought, people like Derrida and Heidegger, together with some stuff in recent British and American philosophy, people like Davidson and Brandon, sort of you know, linking together d some developments in different countries. A Hegelian synthesizer? Well, that makes it sound more important than it is. It's just, just pointing out some analogies between some lines of thought and set forth in Heideggerian jargon and some other some similar lines of thought sent 
set out in the jargon of analytic philosophy. Well, you're a modest man, as I said before. Your editor says irony, contingency, and solidarity will be the three things, perhaps, that will most be memorable from your work, but there's a lot here, and a lot of it is covered in the book Take Care of Freedom and Truth Will Take Care of Itself, published by Stanford Interviews with Professor Richard Rorty. So good to have had you here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for asking me. It's been fun. And uh, as I said, tomorrow in the opening hour, we'll uh, try to deconstruct the uh, State of the Union Address, which will be given tonight by President Bush. We'll also have an hour with a historian of happiness, uh, uh, Darren McMahon. And that's on tomorrow's forum program. Thank you for being with us on today's. We appreciate you listening to us and participating in this program. Here with you Monday through Friday, 9 to 11, and an hour is repeated 10 to 11 in the evening. I want to thank our producers, Robin Giannitasio Mal, Hermione G., and Kevin Guillory, our engineer, Danny Bringer, and our executive producer is Raul Ramirez. And for all of us at KQED, I'm Michael Krasny. <laughs>